do an audit. <laughs> we're here to do an audit. What's up, y'all? This is Ian Edwards, and welcome to the Socket Comic Brand. And we're just harassing Neil right now because during this podcast, this episode, we're going to audit Chelsea's books and find out how the hell every morning they got a new sign in. We need to get to the bottom of this shit. We're also going to talk about Man United uh, uh, beating. Did, yeah, we, it was, this was after Sunday, right? So we're going to talk about United beating Man City. Is it Man City? No, it was Crystal Palace. Dropping points to Crystal Palace. Uh, the game that was just played today, uh, Man City versus Spurs. And we got two big derbies coming up this weekend. We got uh, Chelsea versus Liverpool in the underachiever of the season derby. And we got Man United versus Arsenal in the overachiever of the season derby. So we got those things to discuss. And uh, follow me on Instagram at Ian Edwards Comic. And uh, we have a soccer comic rant TikTok. So check us, check us out for smaller clips on that. And uh, we got the usual suspects. We got Lee Hudson, stand up comic from England, Southampton fan. Hey. What up, Lee? I'm all good. It's nice been watching these midweek games without Southampton playing. I can just kick back and uh, and, and and chill out and just uh, suspend my dread until the weekend. Um, so yeah, been you some on a winning games. streak, bro. You should, you should be you should be good. Uh, no, I know that shit doesn't last. Uh, but no, it's been it's been nice to just uh, yeah kick, kick back and enjoy the games this week. I'm shocked you don't nights. believe in Nathan Jones, bro. <laughs> I believe in him now more than I've ever done. Uh, I haven't changed at all. <laughs> Come on, man. You got Nathan Jones. He's doing his thing. <laughs> and then we got Neil Shakopati, stand-up comic, Chelsea fan. And uh, he, yeah, he's, he's got all the liquor behind him that he's going to need when we start adding up this math, you know. So, yeah, we, we got to get to the bottom of these Chelsea finances. You're buying a whole new team in the transfer window that nobody buys. <laughs> yeah. Like, like you acting like this is the summer transfer window. I don't know what the hell's yeah. going on with y'all. Yeah, I think nobody told these American owners <laughs> that the summer window and the winter are not exactly the same. I, I don't think you get it. They're American. <laughs> Somebody told them, but they don't listen. Yeah, we don't Americans don't give a fuck what you told us. It's like, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, cool. Whatever. <laughs> now this is what we're gonna do. Fuck your rules. Uh, so I guess we'll start with today, Man City versus Tottenham. I don't I, I, I just I just have a, a quick overview of the match. Where, Why isn't Martin here? Because they lost. <laughs> did he was he with you or did he come around to see the game? No, he would have come around, but I wasn't sure I was gonna get my electricity situation straightened uh, out. Yeah. So he did ask me about coming over to see it and I was yeah. like I don't know so then but we played football on Monday night oh okay cool yeah 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 Martin didn't score any goals <laughs> this, but uh he, he played good but uh so he's not here he's escaping our wrath <laughs> and ridicule but uh you know a lot of people complain that Tottenham only plays in the second half of game it's and in this game, they showed everybody, ha, 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 the joke's on you. We can play in the first half, too. But they also showed us they can only play in one half of any game. And they just have to, once they selected that half, they ain't going to do nothing in the second half. And uh, they did create some chances and almost went up, was it 3-2? When they had that chance that Lewis blocked yeah. off the post. Yeah. Yeah. So they that almost went up. Yeah, they almost went back up, but instead they let in two more goals after that. But it's it was a better Spurs performance than you normally get. And uh, you know, it, this was this this game had two things. You got to see what it would be like if Man City lost the game, and you got to see what it's like when Man City eventually won the game all in the same game. Because going down 2-0 to Spurs, which is like basically Man City's bogey team, 
Like, it doesn't matter who's been from Quadratino to, I think when, uh, what's his name from Wolves started coaching? Nuno, him. Nuno, he, his Nuno, first Nuno game was 1-0, one 1-0 one at home, yeah. One, yeah, 1-0 one at home. So, so, and then Champions League with Pasuccino and the league. So, it's definitely been uh, their Man City's bogey team. So, Tottenham, despite the fact that they were on the road, had a good chance to win this and they started the game like they believed, oh, this is the team that we can kill. We can giant kill this team. But the most telling thing to me about this game was Pep's words after, you know, and Pep was like, uh, he criticized his team and he said, they don't have the fire and desire. They act like a team that's won multiple titles and it's, he's admitting all the things he would never admit when they lose. So he's a smart manager. When they lose, he mm. praises them in the media and then they win a big game and he criticizes them. So he, he's smart. Like, like when they lose, he'll say some weird shit like we don't care about the league or something like that. Anything that just <laughs> comes out of his mouth real fast. But then they, they win and he <laughs> says all the things he wanted to say about his team when they lost. But I think he does realize that there is a lack of desire. That is the thing that's kind of missing. Even though he added some new pieces that you always add when you're a long-time manager, try to keep the fire of the team going, add some new coals. Like it, last year, added Grealish, and this year, added Haaland and Alvarez. But it's still, you know, the engine of the team is kind of slowing down. And uh, But I think one of the things that made him say what he said mostly at the end of this game is because that fire he sees it in Arsenal. Like that, like what you see Arsenal doing, like going through teams like a plague of locusts when they hit the field and just destroying everybody. Like from the moment Arsenal hits the field, you know they're the best team on the field until the whistle blows in each half. And you're like, yeah, they won that game and there was no chance the other team had. The only difficulty they had was against Newcastle and probably nine games ago against us or maybe it was more I can't remember but uh like in the Premier League Arsenal is just mm -hmm. th their mentality and it, and I think he knows Pep knows he has to get his team to that Arsenal mentality to even catch them and to pass them and to stay past them but it's still early you don't know the real character of Arsenal yet until they get put under some pressure until mm. all 38 games. So, you know, it, 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 this might not look great for Pep now, even though they're only probably just five points behind Arsenal, but he's addressing what he feels is the main issue after this game, after they won. And I'm sure he's told his team. But what did you guys think of this game, Arsenal's performance and Spurs' one-half performance? Um, I mean, yeah, like we we're saying, it's quite ironic that you know Spurs flipped the half that they uh, <laughs> that they showed up in. Um, but I mean, the first half was sort of even-ish. Like you know, Spurs obviously trying to get at them at times, which was a bit more positive. Like the goal, they, the first goal they scored was pressing City playing out high up in their box, mm. and they committed a lot of players to that press. And I think it's almost like City just got a little bit slack there because like Edison, the ball he played in. So Rodri was quite loose. Rodri tried to play it around the corner, but there was no one there. It was another Spurs player. Um, so they kind of they kind of gifted that one to them. And the second goal was a bit sloppy as well. Um, obviously, the keeper makes a save. And then uh, um, just Kane did really well to keep the ball in there. And then obviously, the keeper makes a save and it's just straight onto the head of Emerson. So, um, but, you know, yeah, Spurs took their chances. But then you've just got to defend better than that. And I know it's easier said than done against City. And, like a couple of the City goals were quite sloppy as well um, in how Spurs let them score them, especially the first couple. Um, but, you know, that's that's what City will do. It's interesting that City went with Alvarez and Haaland in this game. Um, Pep decided to un unleash both of them. Um, and I think we spoke either on the last podcast or two ago about um, how Mares has come into form recently as well and how he's started showing up these last few weeks for City when they've needed him. And um, I mean, he did that today as well. He, he was sort of one of the real driving forces behind that comeback, I thought. Um, mm -hmm. So that's interesting to see. And and yeah, I mean, 
it keeps the title race interesting. It doesn't allow Arsenal to pull too clear. I, I had some some weird conversations going on tonight with friends who are Arsenal fans who are cheering for Spurs. Um, <laughs> ah, that's funny. That's crazy, right? They needed them. Yeah, they put them in a put them in a weird position. Um, <laughs> they were like, "Come on, Spurs." <laughs> um, but then equally, they were they were they were pretty delighted when they you know capitulated as well because they're like ah Spurs you know, it's, so they, it was it was a win win for Arsenal fans tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, either 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 Spurs get ridiculed or they stop uh, a rival getting points so um yeah the, the Gooners I know uh they, they were laughing either way um but I think deep down they actually would have preferred a Spurs win tonight because right. um you know that title is the biggest thing for them and uh it's huge if they can get that so um yeah it was it, it was it was an interesting game to watch like I say the swinging of it and then just shows how big momentum is in football as well like as soon as City got that first goal they you know grabbing the ball out the net you saw the hunger like and you knew that it was gonna it was gonna swing back the other way and I wasn't sure that Spurs were going to be able to stem that tide and that was the case so um yeah when City want to do it and, and like you say Pep's words afterwards really interesting um because mm-hmm. he criticized the fans as well um, yeah, yeah which was a, a bold move saying that like you know because I don't think City were terrible first half they just gifted them a couple of goals like they weren't awful awful they weren't at their best but they weren't awful and then the fans like jeered them off the field um so he was saying you know the fans have got complacent as well as the players um the fans have lost that hunger and um you know that they 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 made a bit of noise when the goals started going in in the second half but um yeah maybe he's i mean i don't think city have got the best atmosphere at the best times anyway um they're not really known for that so yeah i think i think it's just a bit of psychology from pep to try and help get more out of this team and get the fans making it more of an intimidating atmosphere at the Etihad. Because like their last game at home, I think was Everton before that, where they drew. Mm. Um, yeah. So yeah. they have, they haven't had a great time at home. They lost to Brentford at home as well. So maybe he just feels like he needs to get more out of the fans too. And that's his mind games is, is, is sort of having a bit of a go at them because um, they're going to, they're going to need everything they can do yeah. to, to try and get back to Arsenal's, um, sort of points tally so you know they, they're going to need everything he realizes he can't they can't just coast games anymore they, they like they're in a fight now and if they want to bridge that gap and and sort of make that deficit disappear then they need to they need to really up their game on and off the field and and get after it because yeah it was a bit of a wake-up call that first half yeah Pep is coaching the, the team he's coaching the board he's coaching the fans he's like <laughs> we need all everybody needs to <laughs> play their position because you said something about the Man U game against Man City that when the Man United scored, like the, the eruption from the TV in your home was loud. Mm. But I felt during that game that our fans weren't doing anything. And it probably until those moments too. Like I felt like our yeah. fans could have given more like throughout that game themselves just, just to... But I, I get it. They were kind of probably nervous. It's Man City. We remember what happened the last time we played them. So some teams will tense the home fans up. But if you are, you're there, fucking cheer. And like Pep said, the home, the traveling fans for Man City are pretty good. He's talking to the home fans. But I know these fans are going to be mad that he said that because the last time he said something about come out to the Emirates for like a to the to the to the Etihad for. A, it was a mid-season, it was a mid-week game. I think it was a, I don't, can't remember if it was like a, uh, they had to play somebody and it might've been a Champions League game or something. And he like made an appeal for the crowd, people to come out to the game. And like one of the head of the fan associate for Man City was like very insulted. He wanted an apology. And it's like, well, hey bro, like the, look what this guy's done for you. you. You are a little complacent, you know? So you don't, you don't even know how to be real fans. This is the first time you've had like the you know your best run ever. So yeah, what you got, yeah. Neil? Now, I also feel like you know some of these things that Pep says. He kind of I, he gives me the feeling of somebody who suffers from not having enough of a narrative around him. Like you know, it's already accepted that being of every season, Man City are by far the favorites. Then they add Haaland on top of it. Um, you know, the, as Lee said, like their support is not, is not as 
rabbit they're not they're not known to have like the biggest atmosphere um pep guardiola himself like you know all through his career he's been up against um jose mourinho who was you know who was box office right and then even the premier league between him and klopp klopp is the more livelier more histrionics guy you know so there's like, like guardiola and his team like in england has have kind of been like the you know i don't want to say vanilla but you know they they've been kind of like the safe uh vanilla team until they added haland i feel so i think he's he's trying to like i don't know if he's trying to get his players going as much as he's trying to get himself going like the the lack of desire if you think that the players after these many years you know under pep and the same team have a lack of desire can you imagine what it's doing to himself because he's always been in the best team in every league and um lee season after season he's always been the front runner and they keep winning so another premier league title is it really going to change a lot for his resume for his legacy it's not right like for him i guess the champions league now there they have a narrative they have a narrative that people who are both pro pep or anti pep like you know media on either side they're going to build that narrative and go with it but when it comes to a league season i guess apart from the fact that it looks bad to lose to his his uh, you know former assistant coach i i i don't think he has a lot of um things to get get himself going so sometimes i feel like he cuz you know like a lot of these things that he says i mean the team gave him a reaction on the pitch itself right like so he, in a normal scenario i would think the manager would just uh be like all right you know we start the game slow they start the game slow versus us uh chelsea um they didn't have a shot on target almost to the end of the first half uh it was nil nil we had by far the better chances um but they came out of the break and completely blew us out of the water and um uh, you know something similar happened today so um i yes so you know hearing that from him all that is a great interview uh, and probably reveals some of what is going on in the dressing room but i also feel like a lot of that is built for the cameras because pep has to say something to you know to make this look like a storyline um uh, team with the storyline season um but you know just about the game itself um like lee has been mentioning that in past few podcasts like spurs start games so slowly they they almost feel like it's almost feel like they're just waiting and waiting uh for the punches to come in and once they do then they get some up push to action so this time i think they probably heard lee on one of these podcasts because lee's been going on and on about this so <laughs> they start really they start on the front foot and uh, they had a couple of other good chances to it even city had a few chances they always going to have chances right so mm-hmm. um they they get those two goals like big mistake by edison um on on that first goal and uh, yeah i is but you'll see a pattern with spurs this season they've not been solid like they play so many they they try and play really compact football which you know conte has been known for but they've conceded so many goals like it's it's been a, it's probably been their biggest problem like they they concede way more goals than the way they are playing like you know it's it's one thing to like play open uh sometimes with liverpool for example you see them play with that high line and you know if van dijk's not on his game that team can concede goals but um just to just to uh, back you up on that neil so goals against yeah uh, for the teams up the top arsenal have conceded so most teams have played 18 19 or in tottenham's case is 20 games arsenal have conceded 14 city 20 united 22 newcastle 11 mm-hmm. spurs 31 yeah like fulham have only conceded 29 brighton 25 brentford 28 liverpool 25 chelsea 21 like spurs have conceded 10 more goals than chelsea um yeah. like yeah, it's, it's think, pretty i think i think except for the bottom 5 I think they they must be just above that bottom five in terms of yeah goals conceded. Yeah, it's it's not looking good for them there. Yeah, everybody scored on them. Like any team that they've played, they've had to come back even when they get the whole three points if it's against a lower table team, they've had to come back to beat that lower table team. Like cuz yeah. we're talking 
when you say we have let in 22 goals and City 20, like we've been blown out. We've been blown out by them. And yeah. City has only let in two more goals than us. You would figure Spurs would have yeah. let, have been less, but yeah. like, I, you know, but yeah. So this defensive team that Conte is constructing to counterattack, it's not working. Yeah, I mean, if you needed a, you, any bigger proof, because everybody keeps talking about that, like Conte and Spurs, this was a marriage that, you know, it didn't make sense at the beginning. I guess they've had good spells, but is it really going to work out in the long run? Of course, there is no long run when it comes to Conte and his managerial stints, right? But at least, like, get to a spot where you feel accomplished with what you've done. The biggest proof that it's not working is that Antonio Conte is not able to make the team make a team that doesn't concede goals. Like that has never happened in his career. Like even in the second uh, second season at Chelsea, where things were going really bad, we still only I think conceded less than a goal a, a game. Mm. Um, so it's the foundation that he builds his teams on, isn't it? Right. Exactly. Spurs ain't got no foundation. The defense <laughs> yeah. is. You know what? At the end of the day, when you look at these players, you might be like, Conte did a great job considering what he has back there. <laughs> and at the, his post-games uh, press conference, he intimated, he wasn't, it was funny. Pep was angry after he won. Conte was laughing and happy after he lost. It was a, a contrast of like, I'm like, did, did they know who won this game? These two coaches who coached? the same game it was kind of that weird thing and Conte was like kind of happy with the team's performance in some aspects or in a lot of aspects but uh the thing that he said that I'm trying to remember that he said he like the the person asked him the question tried to lead him towards that normal direction that Conte goes when it comes to the board with the board (laughs) And, and instead of saying we need to spend money and buy players, Conte said, that's a question for the board. You know? mm-hmm. So instead of answering it anymore, I think he's had a conversation with the board and they said, hey, man, stop saying that. So then he found a way to not say it, but say it because the, the reporter did ask it. But then in the other press conference, like the official one, when there's like uh, multiple reporters, he, he, you know, uh, he, he, but... I guess the point was he mentioned that this is going to take, there's a gulf and uh, it's going to take a few seasons to fix this gulf. But he didn't say if he was going to be here for those seasons to fix the gulf. He said that today's game is just evident that mm-hmm. there's a gulf and you can see the difference in material that Pep's working with and he's working with. Well, we'll see if Thomas Tuchel can, uh, can bridge the gulf. Because <laughs> that's... <laughs> He's, apparently he wants the job if it's if it's available. So, oh yeah, he's willing to, yeah, he's willing to um, to anger his uh, his Chelsea ties. Um, apparently, so I don't believe that news. I, I know, I know, it's, you, you, it's, you, you don't, don't believe it or, it or don't don't, don't want to believe. believe it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's probably a bit of both. Oh. Yeah. It's probably a bit of both, but yeah, he's probably was, angry enough at Todd Bowley to do that yeah probably but no I'm not talking about it from the whole Chelsea versus Tottenham point of view I just feel it's a lesser job for him I feel his next job is probably managing Real Madrid or Barcelona well you know anger is an amazing thing Lee (laughs) Neil like he's pretty angry at the way there's no way He's happy with the way Todd Bowley treated him. Oh, absolutely. But I also feel like he's a he's also a pretty pragmatic guy. I, I don't think he's the kind of guy who's gonna, you know, cut his nose just by his face. Yeah. I mean, if Spurs would spend money, I would say he should would take that job, but he's he's gonna be limited and it's gonna the type of limits yeah. that won't give you gonna, what, the satisfaction of like actually getting over a hill and winning something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as, as far as Man City playing today, there was more movement overall. And some of the things that they didn't do in the game in the derby <laughs> against us, they did today. Like they took the chance. But Man City love to hold on to the ball. They love to hold on to the ball more than they like to put it in the back of the net. And today they took chances to lose the ball 
to see if they could get it in the back of the net. And, uh, you know, they saw Haaland's run. So he just wasn't out there just going, yo, he made the runs. He chipped some balls over the top. It's like they, they have to admit that they can't ticky-tack at the ball into the goal. First of all, you don't have – your players are not as good as Iniesta, Xavi, and Messi. So as much as you don't want to play English direct football, old-school football – you play mini direct football because you have the guy that you can like, if you're in the middle of the field and you see him make a run, you could chip the ball from there. And, it, and it's not like you're just chipping it into a space. It's like a pass. You're like, you're doing the Glenn Hoddle version of what probably in, the English direct football came from. Like, you know, it's like people with less ability than Glenn Hoddle, like kicking the boot and the ball forward and hoping somebody gets onto the end of it. Like you got the perfect target and you have players of skill that can put it in the area behind those defenses where he could get it. And uh, uh, Courtois saved one in the first half. But, uh, you know, the, the, the one that Alvarez, I think, scored was like Mares to, I think, Rodrigo. Rodrigo seeing Mares move inside, chip, chip it over. That's pretty direct. See the man moving in between defenders, chip it in the air, Mares heads it, and then Grealish misses his shot or it got, gets blocked, and then Alvarez takes a shot. But they they definitely like were proactive today. Like mm-hmm. I think they realize we can't just hold on to this rock. It's of no value unless it's in the back of the net. And so well, the fourth goal was defensive. the most was like an old school English goal. The keeper just Edison yes. just went long, long. <laughs> And he was definitely aiming for Mares, but it did, it went too straight. But then yeah. the miscontrol of Longlet, like and Mares, like staying laser focused and like ah maybe I could still get this. So yeah, exactly like that di- direct and that's like that's like uh what's the name of the the Man City's goalkeeper like Edison Edison like I'm not gonna make that mistake that I made in the first half where I try to pass this to one of my defenders and gave them a goal. That we getting this out of here. I see Mares. I'm t- this, this is, so I think they learned up. This is going to be a new Man City going forward. Like I, I'm, I feel like the, I, I think this, this is going to be different energy for the rest of the season. That's why Arsenal does not have this yet. But we'll see. And, and Mares, I think he's uh, spent a lot of time work coming, going in and out. And that's the nature of Pep Steve, right? Like he rotates a lot. But I think with Sterling gone, Sane went the previous season, Grealish is still to like really, uh, you know, force himself into that starting level. I think Mar- you're kind of seeing Mares take on that senior play. He's 31 now, so he's not, he's not super young either. He's kind of taking on that um, senior creative uh, role. And probably one of the best wingers in world football um, on form at this moment. Because, yeah. you know, it's not, Salah has not been the best of form this season. Human son hasn't been. Um, you know, Neymar probably is. Uh, but, you know, I think Mahrez is right up there. He's really underrated too, like what for what he's done at City. And that's mostly because of the fact that he doesn't play a whole lot of games. Like you'll see Mares play a good game and then he gets dropped, uh, gets rotated rather. And then, uh, uh, but, but like this season, I feel like the way he's been linking up with, uh, with Haaland and Alvarez, uh, getting, getting goals himself. Um, yeah, I think we're going to see him in a lot of these, um, you know, player of the season shouts at the end of the season. Now, one thing I was going to say, like when you just compared Mares and mm-hmm. Salah, mm-hmm. I was like, why is he doing that? They're not the same position, but they are the same position. But he gets so rotated so much. Yeah. <laughs> I never in my yeah. head, like, realized they're both yeah. right wingers. I know Salah yeah. is, yeah, 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 but, yeah. but Mares is like, you just expect not to see him all the time. And I was like, right yeah. wingers, you see them every week. But yeah. So, but yeah, they're the same position. So yeah, yeah, he does get rotated a lot to the point where I didn't even realize they played the same <laughs> position. What were you gonna say, Lee? No, nothing. That's it. No, nothing. Yeah. Uh, you guys want to talk about Man City? 
I mean, Man United, Crystal Palace a little bit before we move on to uh, what a crushing last second worldy <laughs> of a free kick that just took <laughs> the whole three points from us. Why are you laughing, Neil? What's so Because <laughs> I, think, I think even as good as the free kick was, even better was the celebration or the non-celebration. Where Olise, he kind of like just walks back and yeah. you know, a goal kick. That's pretty disrespectful, Absolutely right? Absolutely nonchalant. To not celebrate that and to be like, I, so what's the big deal? I do this what's all the time. Fuck yourself, uh, Olise. 91st minute. But I, yeah. I think this is a little bit of a pattern with him because I remember an interview you did uh, where he scored a goal. I think he was just, this was his debut season. And uh, so the, comment, the interviewer asked him, Hey, hey, so that was a really special goal, huh? So, oh, uh, can you walk me through it? Like, yeah, um, Wilf had the ball. Wilf, he's talking about Zaha. Wilf had the ball, passed it, shot, scored. <laughs> and the interview tried to get more out of him. Uh, and he asked him a long question of, you know, whether it was a good thing for the team in the spell that he's got. And he just replied, yeah. So this is a man of few words and, you know, looks which, like which is- celebrations. Which is weird because he's Nigerian, I think. And the reason yeah. why I know he's Nigerian yeah. is because another Nigerian, AJ Faji, who's an Arsenal fan, was like uh, bragging to me about the drop points yesterday. And he said, Olisi is Nigerian. And yeah, one yeah. thing Nigerians like to do is brag. <laughs> and to see a Nigerian that's actually doing something and not bragging about it, and that is completely <laughs> unusual. <laughs> to be understated about doing something magnificent. Like another Nigerian was bragging to me about what he did. And the Nigerian who's bragging to me about what Elise did yesterday, he's an Arsenal fan. So I'm like, bro, bro, you you shouldn't be... I, I, I guess, he, I guess, yeah, I guess, I guess no, it makes I, sense for him. I guess that's because he is French, Algerian, English, and Nigerian. So he can actually represent all four mm-hmm. countries. <laughs> yeah. Well, those other genes must be stronger it's, than his yeah, Nigerian. Got a little diluted. Yeah, it got a diluted. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, Ni- Nigerians are they're very confident, from my experiences with Nigerians. Uh, yeah, I didn't see the game, so Ian, like, what what really happened? Because uh, well, I saw Bruno's goal. That seemed like really, you know, well taken goal. It was onside. There's no yeah. dispute. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it, you know, speaking of bogey team, so, you know, Man City went to play their bogey team. You know, we, this is one of our bogey teams, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, first half we did good. We battled for everything and we got a goal out of it. Let me see exactly where this goal was called. Bruno Fernandes in the 44th minute. And uh, I, I liked our setup. And... Uh, and we, we, we played Weghorst, which is the best I've ever said his name, Weghorst. And, uh, you know, good coming short, receiving the ball, laying it off to other players. It's his first game. He's getting used to the whole thing. He, he's going to get more comfortable, excuse me, and play better. Uh, I have no problem with how he pressed. I liked what he did out there. And I could see the potential. Uh, and I think Rashford just kind of had an off game. There's some opportunities towards the end where Bruno found him on a long ass ball all the way across field from the right side to the left. He controlled it and had to take several touches to bring it down and which put the defenders back in front of him. And then he tried to take them on instead of looking for a pass. And that was an opportunity. Casemiro had one like, like right at the end of the game, even after those guys scored. Like we could have got the goal to put them away and we didn't. And Crystal Palace just played, they just went harder in the second half, harder than they were in the first half. So there was a lot of incomplete plays between both of us, but they definitely had the ball more. And they they, they had some opportunities. De Gea had like two great saves, one in the first half and one in the second half. But it's just one of those games where you just want it to end so we could just get out of there with the one nothing. And uh, last minute, sure, 
committed the foul, which I don't blame him for making. And those guys got the free kick and they put the ball in back of the net. It was like a scrappy, energetic midfield, middle of the park fighting of a game. And I felt like we came off kind of stretched towards the end of the game. And I feel like us playing on the weekend, playing in all these competitions and playing now, and we don't sub that much. You know, we, we, we don't have, we play who we play. Like in this game, I know there's going to be a lot of after the game critics saying we shouldn't have played Casemiro. We need him for the Arsenal game. But you have to get the three points that's in front of you. That's why you play Casemiro, to try to get the three. It, it, because we don't play him now, there's no guarantee we're going to get the three points against the most informed team in the league, Arsenal, at their place. So if you can get the three from Crystal Palace and then try to get them from Arsenal after, just take care of the business ahead. So I, in hand, so I agree with the plan of Casemiro. And we'll have to figure out what to do this weekend against Arsenal, which we're going to get to. But listen, man, we won nine games in all competitions before this game. We didn't lose this game. It felt like a loss because when you drop all three points right at the end of the game, that is emotionally a loss, but it was a tie. And again, it just, this game adds to our growth process. We're way ahead of schedule. I won't forget that. And our fans, I didn't know where we were playing because our fans were loud at this game. So I want to give our fans props for that. Like, like I, I, t- I, I was in a coffee shop and I had these in. And I'm like, are those United songs? Like the whole fucking stadium sounded like our shit. So, and we, and we needed that energy. But yeah, that's pretty much the overview. Like we, we controlled the, the first half. They got more of the second half. They just added just elements of desire and won some 50-50s. They wouldn't let us do what we wanted to do. And they, they made it difficult for us. What you got, Lee? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think, like you say, the the run you'd been on and the effort that you put into winning those nine games in a row, I think, caught up with you a little bit um, mm-hmm. because it did look jaded. And like you say, you haven't got a huge squad where you can rotate too much. So, yeah, you kind of saw that, like you say, especially second half as well. Like De Gea was called into a few saves um, as well. And I think in the end, Palace were just about... I think you were probably just about the better team over the full 90 minutes, but Palace... Yeah. Like, I don't think it, there's too many complaints with them deserving uh, a goal in the end um, because they, they did put a lot into that game whoa, as well. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, and especially when it's a goal like that as well. Because like I say, De, De Gea bailed you out a couple of times when they could have scored. Like, I think Gwehi could have done a little bit better with that header from the corner um, as well. Like, he gave, it a, he gave De Gea like a little bit too much of the ball to be able to save it kind of thing. Like, he could have maybe gone a bit further downwards with it, but... Yeah, I mean, and there was obviously some contentious decisions in that game. The the free kick that led to the foul that led to the free kick for Elise's goal was a little bit soft. Um, probably just about a foul though. What about the what do you do you think it was a penalty for uh on McTominay? McTominay? Um at first I thought it was, and then I watched all of the many replays, and he just about gets a like a toenail. Yeah. He gets a toenail on the ball. He has to get that as well. Otherwise, that is a penalty. If they go to VAR and they see that he hasn't got anything, then, but it's the slightest touch. You see it because, like, Matomini gets there first and then it sort of just deviates. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's a harsh one because, especially if you're Matomini, you think you've got there first and he's been bundled over. You can't dispute that, but the player has got a slight touch on the ball. Um, so, yeah, no penalty for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, Palace, Palace are a weird side because they've been through some bad results recently. Um, but they're always a team, especially at home, they're always a team who can pick themselves up and, and get at you. Like they've got good players in their team who, when they're, when when Zaha's in the mood, he can trouble any team in the division. Um, like Elise is, is, he's growing into the Premier League. Um, like he's still a little bit inconsistent, but when he's on it, he's a, he's a top quality player. Um, Edward is a handful when he wants to be. Um, 
So they've got these guys who are, you know, you can cause a problem for teams and then they're just solid as well. Like I like Anderson and Gray at the back for them and Gate as a solid goalkeeper as well. So yeah, I mean, the Palace don't really roll over for teams. Um, so I think it's, it's a, like you say, it'll feel like a loss, but you know, you didn't lose. It add another point to the tally, which every point counts in that top four race as well. Um, and, and Spurs didn't get any, so <laughs> it's still, uh, you still, you still, you still opened out the gap on Tottenham, um, which is the main thing. True that, um, true that. We still have a game in hand on them too. Exactly. So yeah, life could be worse. And, and I felt like it's one of those games where every team, like even Everton has these games. Mm. Like we thought they were going to get wiped out by Man City. And it's like, they have to get a point. Uh, and, and they're, and even if a point from a game they're supposed to get blown out in, or, you know, like Crystal Palace results were so bad, like they had to get something out of this game. And so that extra edge was added to them in the second half. So. Are you, yeah. um, are you frustrated with that Casemiro tackle at all? Because it felt like it was one he didn't need to make like that. Like it was, it was pretty reckless. Um, <laughs> I'm not even frustrated. I, I knew he was going to get the yellow and I knew everybody was going to be like, they shouldn't have played Casemiro <laughs> because now yeah. he's going to miss the Arsenal game and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, you know, somebody mentioned this on one of the podcasts and I thought, thought it was smart. Like uh, one of the, uh, you, you could play uh, Martinez there. Yeah. And put I Shaw mean, back in center back. And you, you, we, you started McTominay when you beat them at Old Trafford. <laughs> yeah. He seems to up his game against Arsenal for some reason. Yeah. He likes playing against them. Yeah, That's it was what happens when you're from the academy. <laughs> <laughs> he just started counting down those, those big derby games. Hilarious. Yeah, I mean, your midfield three against them at Old Trafford was McTominay, Ericsson in a deeper role, and then Bruno in front of them. Um, do you reckon that could be the same one again this time? Or do you think they'll put Fred in? Fred can't play. Is it the six? Is it the six is the CDM? Yeah. Six or a four, depends on what country you're from. But yeah. yeah he can't play six because he feels he's an eight. Yeah. So where he plays. But somebody was saying from one of the podcasts that you, they probably play Fred to stay on Odengard, mm-hmm. which the way he did De Bruyne, I don't know if you need that. I know Oden, Odengard is on fire right now. I don't need, know if you need to mark him <laughs> like that, though. But uh, I, I like the idea of Martinez. And then the, also they're saying if you put play Martinez there, then McTominay's confidence would be shattered that He's a CDM and he didn't play him as CDM. Hmm. But but Tommy had three years to make that position his own. So now <laughs> I'm gonna be worried about his ego. And he didn't show me. Like he did four great games, yeah, when yeah. At, after our two big losses at the beginning of the season. But he had three years to be <laughs> the guy. <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna worry about his, you know. And if his ego is shattered, then he's not the guy. Yeah, I, I see. Some, I don't. I don't a think, man would come back from that. I don't think you'd play Martinez there for the first time against Arsenal. Like, I know he's played there before, but for you guys, he's always played at the back. And I think I think you'll need him at the back as well because I think he's the perfect centre back to play against Arsenal because everything is like fast moving and like he's got the mobility to and the tackling ability to deal with players like Saka, I think, who's going to come in and cut in off that, that right side. So mm-hmm. I think, um, I think it will be Varane and, and him at centre back, I'm sure left back potentially. Um, but I mean, we'll see. I, I, I could, I could see you playing, like I say, the same midfield as you played them at Old Trafford. You want, you want to hear a crazy pitch? You want pitch? No. <laughs> God, that's it. Both of them. Put both of them in. Put Bruno on the put Bruno on the wing. Ericsson can play the 10. McFred behind. Bruno on the wing, which they do sometimes do. Juan Bissaka. He's defensive minded. You know, and if he can 
I, you know, I want to give him props for this get for this for all the last few games. Like everybody's back on one the soccer's dick. Everybody that was off <laughs> is back on it. Like people was like, sell him. They wanted to like burn his house down just to make sure he could <laughs> stay in Manchester. Stay in Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's yeah. out of here. Like there's so many players that they said is definitely out of here. And all of a sudden, like they're living up to their price tag under a good coach. So I like I never wanted McTowney to leave. I knew he couldn't go forward, but I was like, couldn't somebody coach him to go forward? And he's learning mm-hmm. how to do that now. And then we have him and lot. So I don't know, man. We he he can't play there. He he's he's nah. used to having he's used to having the game that side of him and the touchline there. He can't play through. I he'll I reckon he'd lose his mind playing with three sixty around him. Like it's such a specialized, specific role. I mean, ask Chelsea fans; they can't find anyone to play there. Um, like it's it's such a specific role. Like you can't because put that's a because Martinez Chelsea or a one in there for one attacking, game. Attacking midfield. <laughs> that's on them. <laughs> <laughs> So, which which game do we, do we talk about the games, or do we do we run through Chelsea's books first? What do you want to do, Lee? We want to run through Chelsea's books. Let's, let's do the let's let's do the audit first. Let's get let's get <laughs> let's, 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 let's get this Chelsea on. So, let's Lee, just get this Lee, financial Lee, fair play Lee, audit. Wear my glasses. Lee, you, you, you get your glasses. You want to get a drink too? <laughs> no, no, I need the opposite of a drink. <laughs> I'll need some. I'll so need some. More, Okay, <laughs> keep me so, up. Let me just go in our chat because uh, let me just see this announcement. Let's head into Wall Street. <laughs> yeah, the wolf of who's running your books over there? The wolf of Wall Street, bro. Do you, do you have official the, numbers the, you want to question him about? The, the Todd Father yeah. is the name uh, Chelsea fans are running with. <laughs> the Todd <Todd-father>. Father. <laughs> the Todd Father. Hilarious. I, I, I saw a bunch of people joking that he's putting a bid for Jim Radcliffe after he's linked with uh, <laughs> Iron United. <laughs> so, uh, no, no, you're not, you're not going to buy United. I'm going to buy you. Um, <laughs> but I mean, let me let me just run through the the transfers here. In Euro- I got I got them in euros. Yeah. So this is since the start of the season. Wesley Fofana, eighty million euros. Yeah. Mudrick, 70 million euros. Kukurea, 65 million euros. Sterling, back? 56 million euros. On? The Mudrick one back. is spread over 80 years, to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, they financed that shit. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still, I mean, even though, like I said, they no, keep, up, going, like, keep going, keep um, going. So um, Badashil, 38 million euros. Kulabali, 38 million euros. Uh, Chukwumeka, uh, 18 million euros. Andre Santos, 12.5. Uh, Albema Yang, 12 million euros. Uh, David Datro Fofana, 12 million euros. Zhao Felix is alone, 11 million euros. Damn. Um, the keeper they signed from Chicago, uh, Slonina, from Slonina. Uh, nine, 9 million euros. Um, and Zakaria from Juve on loan, 3 million euros for a loan fee. Um, but I mean, that's a that's a and, and, and that's that's missing. That, that's missing. And I know that's, that's probably because you're looking at transfer market. Uh, that's the missing the un- no, that's missing Cesare Casade, who, who we got from uh, from Inter under 19s for 15 million <laughs> euros. But but they, I think transfer market listed for the they have a separate team for the Chelsea under 21s. Uh, okay, that's why yeah. it doesn't come up in the senior team. But that's another 15 million euros you can throw. And in. then how how much you, is it? 40 million euros that you're going to spend on Madueke? Uh It's 35 euros, I think. Let me check what it. Mr. I mean, uh, at the very least, at least he counts as a homegrown player. So, well, actually, that's interesting. He counts as a homegrown for, I think, Premier League, not for China, for UEFA, because Premier yeah. League just want you to be, you know, um, <laughs> just just want you to be with the, uh, just care about three years at an English club before you turn twenty-one. <laughs> but UEFA won three years between the period of 15 to 21, and he left for PSV at the age of 16. So for any UEFA competition, I have to say it's it's ridiculous after the <laughs> UEFA competition instead of the Champions League, because I don't think we're going to be in the Champions League next season. But for UEFA competition purposes, he's probably not home for him. Uh, he's because he one of my, one of my friends one of my friends used to coach him at Crystal Palace. Oh, so, okay. Um, when he was when he was very very small, because um, he's yeah. only twenty years old now. Right. Um, 
but yeah, he was at, he was at Palace for a little bit, and then he was at Spurs. Yeah, um, and then went to PSV. So I mean, leave. yeah, like so you know. We've spent a lot, right? I don't think it's, it's it's apparently we're still gonna try and get a midfielder and a striker and a right back. And I think then we'll be done. So let's look at this number, which is I think at four so four seventy million euros so far since they came since they took over. That's probably gonna top off at somewhere around say six fifty to seven hundred million euros, right? So yeah, it's. I told you on the last last podcast. Like, I'm a little scared about what's going to happen. There's probably a big FFP, um, uh, you know, sanction coming up in the future. But then I read <laughs> the deep dive that Sis Ramble put up on Twitter, and uh, so from his point of view, essentially what's going on is that we've because we are. Uh, spreading these contracts over, like, that's why you're seeing these huge contracts, right? You're seeing eight-year contracts, so they don't count on the book right now. They they only count like, for example, Mudrik seventy million counts only like less than ten million a year on the books right now. But every time you sell a player, the full profit from that sale counts on your book for that year. So it's a little bit of accounting magic that that's happening. So they're kicking. Essentially, what they're doing is they're kicking the can down the road, right? But the only way this works is a couple of things need to happen. You still need to sell a whole bunch of players, which will happen. Uh, by my numbers, we have around 15 to 18 players, senior players, uh, to be sold. Damn. Um, is that including Lukaku? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So in the next couple of windows, I expect around 15 to 18 players to be. Okay. So that will give you even you know, at a conservative amount, that should give you around 200 million. And the other thing that needs to happen is that because we are giving these long contracts, the margin for error right now, like, you know how Chelsea used to have this. So you got Ziyech, Werner, Pulisic, Havertz. None of them can be counted as real successes at Chelsea right now. But we are kind of like moving them on. We, we are going to let them all go. Maybe only keep Havertz from that uh, bunch. The, the margin of error for failures is going to be considerably low right now. So all these players that we're getting right now either need to bang for Chelsea or they need to do enough on loans to be sold at almost an equal price to, to what we've bought them for. So that's number two. That needs to happen. Number three is Champions League qualification. Champions League qualification, maybe this season, if we don't get it, we can maybe still... Uh, still float. But from next season, I, I don't think we can do without Champions League qualification. We need to be called for the Champions League every season. So that's kind of the way they're, you know, they're going about it. Um, you know, they, they've, they've, um, they've, they've obviously gone through, they've, they're looking at this as a math problem, right? Which is kind of refreshing for me. They're looking at this as an accounting problem instead of trying to think about, uh, oh, we need to get, uh, oh, we need to, you know, the previous regime, what they used to do is one out, one in. So somebody goes out, you replace just that player. They're saying, okay, we got this new manager, we got this new recruitment team. What are the profiles you need, need and what are your top one, two, three uh, from these uh, on, on each position, right? Now let's try and see if we can get number one, number two, number three. Uh, and if we can, we don't care. We'll figure it out. Tell me the number that we need to raise and in how much time we need to raise to do that. And we'll figure it out. And obviously another big thing in all of this is there are, from the non-playing side, there are things that will probably change. Like the stadium is getting a redevelopment. So the capacity is gonna go up. The match day revenue is gonna go up. Uh, sponsorship, I think, Roman Abramovich and his team in the last five, six years kind of were, uh, you know, they kind of fell asleep at the wheel. The, a lot of clubs have kind of gone ahead of us in terms of uh, their commercial deals. And uh, we, we, need to, we need to keep pace. We need to probably outpace them. So uh, he's 
he said in a recent interview that you know they they, they have plans to have one billion uh, pounds in revenue um, for at Chelsea, which would be insane. We're doubling our current revenue. Our current revenue is somewhere between four hundred to five hundred million a year. So, yeah, I mean, in terms of that's that's the pitch. I don't know how much of this is gonna. And as I said, like there are red flags that can easily be tripped. For example, if we don't get uh, tough for this season, and then we don't get tough for next season. It could be a real problem. If you fail to sell players like Lukaku, Ziyech, it'd be a real problem. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're walking a thin line, but uh, you know, it looks like they feel confident that they'll be able to do it. I just can't wait to see what you're going to buy in the morning. That's a complete surprise from that game. Like, <laughs> like when I open the chat and see another player in a Chelsea uniform revealed by yeah. Fabrizio we, Romano, I'm just... I can't even guess who that's going to be. I just yeah. know it won't be someone in the position that you need the most, a CDM. I don't know why you're buying around the position at such velocity, but hey, man, that's what y'all want to do. Like, just get a CDM, fam. They, they didn't got none. What about Amrabat? Do something. Yeah, I don't know what happened. He was good in the World Cup, right? I don't yeah. know what happened. But uh, looks like we did bid for uh, uh, Moses uh, uh, Casadio from Brighton. We also bid oh, for yeah. Bis- we also tried to get Bisuma from Spurs, and they said no, you know, no, thank you. But you know, my I I still feel if the price is going that high, we should just go get Declan Rice. If it's going beyond that 70, 80 million price uh, range, but uh, yeah, um, at least like unlike even this last window, I didn't have a lot of confidence in our transfers. But now I feel like because we have this, you know, this recruitment team, Avengers team that they've assimilated from all over the place, I feel like at least from a profile point of view, there should be, you know, uh, there should be a lot of due diligence happening on these. I mean, how much did you pay for, what's his name, Mur- Murder? 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 I think it's a 70 million euros uh, base fee plus 30 million in add-ons. What's the, what's the most you paid? How much you pay for Unkunku? Oh, by the way, yeah, Unkunku is not even in that list at least. Yeah, yeah. We talked about so yeah. Because he comes um, next year. He comes next year, and Season. I don't think Unkunku has been officially announced. It's just that we got a here we go from uh, Romano and people like those. So yeah, but he's probably around that 70, 80 million too. Yeah, you should just pay for Declan Rice then. Because yeah. if you don't pay for him, you know who's going to pay for him? Arsenal. Arsenal. Because they and that's should. that's scary. If Declan Rice, Partey, and Odegaard, that would feel scary. Yeah. They should because, you know, we were talking about how, like, when a team gets to the point where they need to spend that big money for that position that they need filled. Yeah. So that's yeah. just to solidify all the, the rings and things. You also uh, never yeah. know when Thomas Partey is ineligible to play football. So I think, yeah. Yeah, I think oh, yeah. from an off the pitch point of view, it makes sense for them to get somebody else in there. Yeah. Uh, what did you guys, this, what did you, how, what was the, what's the reaction to the match of the day sex sounds? <laughs> Lee? I mean, who did that? Hilarious. Somebody who works there? Jarvo so. 19. He's a, a Jarvo, um, <laughs> that's that he's a known prankster he's pretty well yeah. known uh, somebody who had access to the studio clearly um but, i mean i mean yeah it's just funny i mean something something needed to liven up an fa cup replay so um jarvo yeah, 69 and, and, that's his name jarvo 69 and gary lineker seemed to find it funny as well so yeah um yeah all, all in good humor <laughs> yeah he had the right energy for that prank yeah, like if, if somebody <laughs> was hosting with the wrong energy, yeah. then it could have been like terrible. But he had the right energy, and when he was interviewing uh, the Mister Mister Newcastle, he had the right energy. Shearer, yeah, yeah Shearer. So yeah, I like. Yeah, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to see that happen with Sooners or Keen. Oh, oh, on there. oh Raikin, <laughs> <laughs> Raikin would like he would literally launch it to somebody. <laughs> That's oh. hilarious. Yeah, you don't play that. I like how uh, Danny Murphy after the game he said that 
Well, Lineker was saying that it was probably me. So I actually got a little pattern there. I really thought it could have been me. So I started, he started looking at his <laughs> mobile phone. Hilarious. The, the uh, whole thing was on YouTube too. Like the guy who did it, he's put a whole behind the scenes of the way they actually set it up. And the fact that he was actually calling while watching it on TV. He's, yeah, he's I, saw, I saw the part when he was calling and when he was watching it yeah, on TV. Yeah, yeah. But I'm like, how did he get it in there? But I, I'll just look yeah. for it on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. He he. Uh, also, I remember like a couple of years ago, he did a similar prank at, uh, well, not the same prank, but he did a prank during an India-England cricket match. He mm-hmm. literally came out, an Indian, uh, you know, a new batsman was supposed to come in. And he mm-hmm. was wearing the full India kit with the oh, helmet sure. and the pads. And he just walked in, like, I think it was in the edge bastion or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, was, it was hilarious. How does he not get arrested for these pranks? He got arrested and he did the same thing two days later at the next game. <laughs> no, you, you guys just encouraged him like, by not punishing him. And yeah, the whole Indian season. team is like, wait, did, did he get arrested? What kind of arrest <laughs> happened in your country that the guy can come back and do the same thing in two days? Speaking of like pranks, this is not a prank, but during the Crystal Palace game, a fan ran on the field and went up to Casemiro and, mm. and took a selfie with him. And it, it, like he effortlessly got up to Casemiro. And Casemiro's like, all right, and took the photo. Like, <laughs> dude, we're in the middle of a game. And then the guy gave himself to the, to the, to the people that normally chase him around the field. Uh, he walked towards him. Like, he's like, I, I got the photo. I'm good. So, yeah. So, Casemiro's Chelsea. Like the only guy who, got, who could keep up with Casemiro. <laughs> Yeah, he was the only person that game that caught up, kept up with Casemiro. Chelsea versus Liverpool. Let's do this first. This is the, one of the biggest games this weekend. Two teams mm-hmm. underachieving. Both teams spending tons of money, getting no results. Both teams need the same player or the same type of player buying all around that same type of player. Mm-hmm. And now they're up against each other at Anfield. How is this going to go down? What's your thoughts? Thoughts and prayers? I mean, both teams are literally on the same points. I think they have a game in hand. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, we are we, both teams definitely for them and for us. Champions League qualification, we need it. And we're way off it. Like, this is not like being four points, five points. I think we're like nine points or ten points off fourth place. So both teams need to go on a run of win after win after win. And uh, yeah, one of them is going to trip tomorrow. So uh, I, it's kind of like one of those games, you know, like easily movable force meets stoppable <laughs> uh, object, something like that. Uh, I don't really know what to expect because our team is also going through so much clutch. We've had so many injuries and now players are coming back. Apparently, Reese James and Chilwell made the team training uh, today. Mm. But yeah, I don't expect them to start the game on against Liverpool. But uh, Loftus Cheek is back, so a few players are coming back through injury. Modric is here. Uh, Badiashile, who started as centre back last game, he's there. Um, apparently, they're even trying to get this uh, Madwiki guy's medical done today or tomorrow, so that he can be eligible to play on uh, versus uh, uh, versus Liverpool. So. Yeah, it, there's a lot of chaos, so there's no point trying to like assess how we're gonna play. Um, and also, another thing that's happening is I don't think we have enough players to uh, enough spots to register all these new players. We need to probably like maybe... apparently you, you you only need to remove one for Champions League. Champions League, the probably more for Premier League. Um, I'm not sure. Because we had, at the beginning of the season, we had 15 uh, foreign players. And you're allowed a maximum of 17, you know, who don't meet any other criteria. And since then, we've got Fofana, the striker. We've got Felix, obviously. We've got Murdrick, and you're now getting this. Well, he, I think Nani Madueke, he's going to be fine because he's going to be counted as homegrown. But we have these three, and then we have Slonina, who's probably going to be a backup keeper because Mendy's out. So I don't know how they're going to fit everybody in 
may we have to like not register somebody like Pulisic or Kante who were out for a long time now. Uh, Zakaria maybe. So yeah, lots Zachary of Zakaria is injured now? For how long? Yeah, 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 he got injured and he's gone for a while. Like Your best guy? Yeah. <laughs> recently? Yeah. <laughs> Jeez, it's almost man. a curse to play play well for us. Yeah, so. pretty much. Yeah. We've had an amazing 16 minutes, got a red card out for three games. Uh-huh. So I'm just worried what this Madrid guy is going to do. This is how I feel about this game. The way I feel about this game is I should be rooting for Chelsea so that Gakpo could lose. And I'd be like, that's what you get <laughs> for going to Liverpool <laughs> instead of waiting for our tedious long negotiation to figure out a way to get you. <laughs> which I can't even really blame you for choosing to go to Chelsea. But uh, but I feel like in the last, was that an FA Cup replay against Wolves? Yeah. That, that uh, yeah, Liverpool had, like, their, their midfield, who's been incapable of pressing, finally was learning how to press and cause turnover. And it was as close to, like, last year Liverpool or seasons before Liverpool that I've seen them. And so I'm going to start believing them. And I don't know if they can do it in back-to-back games because it's, it, it's a nature thing, right? It's the type of person you are, you know? And then sometimes you could try to be somebody else and sometimes you'd be successful at it. Sometimes you're not, but I believe they got at least one more game of faking it in them because this is, this would normally be a marquee game. Is it would be huge. You guys have gone up against each other for cups and titles and everything. So the game kind of still has that vibe. It's you have to like actually wake up as a viewer to realize this game kind of means nothing compared to what it meant last year when these two teams met multiple times and just in years past, you know. So maybe because of what it used to mean based on last season, the Liverpool players will step up again. I, like, I'm, I'm not confident about the Chelsea organization, who's injured, who's not injured, I'm Graham Potter. There's more factors to worry about for Chelsea than there is for Liverpool. So we'll see. Uh, so I'm going Liverpool. Yeah, it, now that he said it, it almost feels like a lifetime ago, last time we guys played, it was the FA Cup final, right? Mm-hmm. It feels so far back. Like we had Tuchel back then. It's a completely mm-hmm. different different setup. But um, yeah, I think both teams have a lot of problems, but uh, they're obviously a little more settled. So I think from an objective point of view, and one thing that Liverpool has done well this season is, despite the Nothing. fact that they've had, <laughs> they've had a lot of issues, <laughs> but they're still among the one of the most high, uh, you know, the number of chances they create at such a high volume, they're still up there, you know, in that top two or three. So uh, it's just a matter of finishing better and like not concede, keeping it tight at the back, which obviously is an issue with Novan Dijk. Uh, and Fabinho's form seems to have dropped off. Uh, and their midfield is definitely not as quick as you'd expect Klopp midfield to be. But, um, you know, they have they at least have a few parts of the game that is going well. And I don't think you can say the same about Chelsea. So, but you guys create chances, though. Like, I see you guys last, low chances all the time. Last two games, yes, we did. But before that, you remember how I was telling you, we were like 13th or 14th in the league for big chances created. We've created quite a bit last two games. But, uh, yeah, you know, we need to we need to do a lot more. Yeah, you guys are on form with missing chances the last two games. So you, <laughs> you, you're you back to creating. Liverpool is just a, a little less unsettled than Chelsea right now. That's why yeah, I'm going yeah, yeah. for Liverpool. Yeah. What do you think, Neil? I mean, Lee, for this one? Um, I mean, like you say, it's the, it's the battle of the underachievers. It's hard to, uh, <laughs> it's hard to really pick a team out and go, yeah, like they'll, you know, dominate this when I say Liverpool got a bit of confidence back with that um, FA Cup replay win um, but yeah I mean it's 9th v 10th it's weird to be saying that about a Liverpool Chelsea game this is 9th v 10th um, it's yeah I I would probably make Liverpool slight favourites but I don't think there's much in it Chelsea could easily win this game um, 
I mean, I'm going to sit on the fence and say a draw, um, I reckon, because I think neither team wants to lose this game. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean they're going to both play defensively, um, but I just think it means it'll be a tense one without too much in it. Um, I think if Liverpool, like Neil said, Liverpool create a lot of chances. So if Liverpool find their finishing, um, I think they could win it. Um, but I'm going to sit on the fence and say a draw. I'll, I'll give them the Anfield thing too. They're at Anfield. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. Yeah. Chelsea's <laughs> had some, they both had shocking losses this year. Mm. You know, they, they both can surprise surprise me the way they've lost, the who they've lost to this year. So we'll see. And we'll go to the next big derby this week. And this is the overachieving derby between uh, <laughs> Arsenal and Man United. You know, they, these guys used to battle it out for titles. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're both in the top four. One's number one. Number, one's number three. The game's being played at Arsenal's ground. So, and Arsenal, you know, didn't play midweek. They're rested, you know, they just pummeled Spurs and now they got us at home and they just beat Spurs on the road. So I'm kind of, I feel like, you know, based on some of the stuff we're talking about, about the Manchester Crystal Palace game, where Manchester United is the only team in the Premier League in four competitions and we're just playing, playing, playing. Our squad is limited. We just lost Casemiro and we're going to the best team in the, on form in the league. And they have revenge because we're their only loss for the season. And they got this beef about this goal that they scored that got taken away. And it's just like another time for them to prove themselves. And they don't want to lose the point gap that they have against City. You know, so, you know, this is a very important game for them. And and they just are very confident. Like, even when they lost to us, they lost to us confidently. They didn't back down. They weren't in a shell, and they were trying. But we are smart, and uh, we're, 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 we're street savvy. You know, we, 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 we're street wise, and we have capabilities. And sometimes Ten Hag sort of surprises me with who he puts in the lineup. And I'm like, you put that guy in the lineup? That's not going to help us. And then that person helps us. and you know, the, the way he's improved certain players. So we have a chance. I, 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 I'm going to push it and say we get a point. But I think Arsenal wins this. I reckon, I reckon a draw, but I think Arsenal will go ahead and this time it'll be you who put it back, the opposite of the Palace game. I think Arsenal, mm-hmm. will, I think Arsenal will score within the first half an hour of the game. And then I think you'll get them in the second half for 1-1. That's my prediction for this one. All right. I like that. I like the fact that you gave us something. I appreciate that. <laughs> what do you think, Neil? I think the Casemiro one is going to be a big miss for you guys. So, uh, yeah, I am going Arsenal for this game, which is, which also is like a little bit of vested interest because I need Newcastle and United to start dropping points now. <laughs> for, <laughs> our, for our top four, any hopes of getting top four. <laughs> who's who's four? Newcastle. I think Newcastle for your third. So, but you guys yeah, are both on similar uh, number of points. You, you should be trying to hope Newcastle <laughs> slows down. Hey, hey, leave us alone. <laughs> more, more, <laughs> more frogs in the well, the better. <laughs> <laughs> Pull everybody down. <laughs> that that means, as pessimistic as Neil is, that means he feels like Chelsea could still pull off something and get back into the top four. You see that? You see how he pretends to not believe in his team? But that statement alone lets me know what you're really thinking deep down. Not even so deep down. That you this feel is, like this is not this over is, 20 games. This, this, is, this is what three points versus Crystal Palace does to you. <laughs> what, Neil, what Neil needs to be doing is rooting for us against Aston Villa because Villa are only three points behind Chelsea and if if Liverpool beat Chelsea but Villa beat Southampton then Villa oh, can uh, oh, Villa can get up there <laughs> Villa can get up there I mean yeah, yeah. They're, they're probably not going to overtake you on goal difference but they'll pull level with you <laughs> yeah, we yeah they'll crawl up your pants leg if they beat Southampton so you better <laughs> yeah I think I think our goal difference is is like zero or plus one 
some, one. Uh, some yeah yeah <laughs> Villa, villa's minus five though so they're oh, okay. gonna jump you but they could yeah. come level on points <laughs> lee, lee, lee you gotta be careful against this villa team man <laughs> Yeah, I mean, at least we know Danny Ings isn't going to score against us. Um, <laughs> oh, gonna, yeah. He, he looks like he's on his way to West Ham. Um, oh, yeah. Our, um, yeah. yeah, apparently that's almost done. Um, it's a shame. I, I would have liked us to go back in for him because obviously he knows the club. Um, a lot of the same players are still there and he's a he's a proven goal scorer when he's fit. And apparently it's only 15 million that West Ham are getting him for. And, you know, he's, like I say, he's a proven Premier League goal scorer. Um his injury proneness would be a worry. I mean, I think for West Ham, between him and Mikel Antonio, they'd get one full player because um, yeah. Antonio's always Skamaka? injured as well. Is, is Skamaka injured for West Ham or something? No, he's he, he's pretty consistent for them, to be fair. Um, but I mean, they need all the firepower they can get because they're right down in that fight with us at the moment, same amount of points. So, um, But yeah, I mean, Villa, I mean, our kids played them in the FA Youth Cup um, at Villa Park during the week and we beat them 4-1. So, you know, if the senior team can just, <laughs> if they can just emulate that result, I'd be pretty happy. Um, but, you know, I'll take a, I'll take a shitty one nil if we need to. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we just, we need something from this game just to keep the momentum going and keep the confidence going because I never know with this team at the moment, if one loss will just put us back to rock bottom confidence. So um, hopefully we can keep it going. You know, the new sign-ins are, are getting some minutes now. Um, Orsic came on against Man City. Alcaraz came on against Everton. Um, apparently, we, we've been linked with about 20 strikers this week as well. Um, oh, all yeah. of them from like different middling sort of clubs across Europe. Um, there's one of them who scored for the USA against um, uh, Netherlands at the World Cup, Haji Wright. Um, no, no, Haji. He's a centre forward playing in Turkey. Um, so he's been linked with us. Um, the one that we're apparently closest to is a guy called Nicholas Jackson. Um, he's like a Senegalese forward. He plays with Villarreal. Um, but my view is if he was any good, then Emery would have gone back for him. <laughs> Why don't you try to get a Bubakar? He's going to Besiktas. Oh, yeah, he's replacing Weghorst. Weghorst, yeah. Because they, they, yeah. Besiktas wouldn't let Weghorst go until they knew oh, okay. they were getting a replacement. Apparently that deal was being done. He used to play in Turkey for Fenerbahce as well, Abubakar. Oh, okay. So he's going somewhere familiar. Um, but no, we've been linked with a whole bunch of guys. There's a guy at, um, at Ghent in Belgium um, who seems decent, a 28-year-old forward who's scored quite a few goals and our Danish director of football knows because um, he had him at a club previously. So yeah, we're being linked with some... We need, we need a striker, I think, to come in and... and boost the ranks a striker and a CDM would be would be perfect if we can get them but um, you know we said before it's a tough one tough window to buy players we bid for the, the Danish guy who's the captain of Lecce um, in Italy and we've had that knocked back they want like double what we've asked for or what we offered so sure. um, we'll see what goes on but yeah it'll be an interesting month to see if we can get those reinforcements but I mean Anything against Villa would be a bonus, a draw or a win. Let's keep getting those points on the board. Keep the confidence up. Don't lose the game. And hope, hopefully West Ham and Everton destroy each other. And <laughs> if that one could finish a draw, that would be nice. A draw and a bunch of red cards each. <laughs> you need to buy people with experience. And yeah. like one, dis one disadvantage Southampton has for themselves is that they're in the Premier League. But one advantage that they have for them is that they're in the Premier League. So you mm. can get somebody from a really good team in a different league to Southampton because it's in the Premier League. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I, I, like, I think you got enough young, inexperienced players for the future. And mm -hmm. I, I think you just need to like really put some definitive class in your ranks to like yeah, keep you up. 100%. So, I mean, that's, I, that's, what, that's what we did with Orsic. He's 30, uh, which mm -hmm. was a complete, you know... Um, change in our policy to get a player like that in and and yeah we need one or two more of those because we can't have mm -hmm. um we can't have people that are too green coming in and, and being chucked into a premier league relegation battle because that's a very specific type of uh type of fight yeah it's like then they're going to be in the championship and they have to sell them anyway it's <laughs> like you, you gotta yeah you gotta yeah i feel like there's something big you guys can pull off just because you're a premier league team you know like like Weghorst. When he first came to Premier League, he went to Burnley. And, you know, that was a good buy for Burnley. It didn't work out, 
you know, because mm. of Burnley. But that that was a good buy. There's got to be something you can pull <laughs> off, you know. We should have gone for Suarez. I mean, he went to Gremio in in Brazil and he scored a hat trick in the first half of his debut um, oh, the other night. <laughs> yes, yeah, something like that. Shit, what's his name? He's going to Sergio Aguero. He's going to Ecuador <laughs> to play. Like, where's Cavani? I guess he is with somebody, but like, he's a Valencia, I think. Yeah, it's got to be something. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Um, but yeah, I'm happy with the business we've done so far. But yeah, a couple more. A couple more is definitely needed. But that West Ham Everton game is going to be really interesting because I think if, if if one of them loses and loses without putting up much of a fight, that manager's getting sacked. Whichever one of them it is. If it's Everton losing, I think Lampard's gone. If if West Ham lose, then Moyes mm-hmm. is gone. And then as soon as Lampard him. gets sacked, he can go to Everton. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. I wouldn't fire West Ham uh, Moyes. I think, I don't know what's happening to West Ham. Are they in Europe? Because um, because of the sure. Christmas break and the uh, and uh, the 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 Europe break because of the World mm. Cup, I forgot who's in what competition. Yeah, but they I might be in the Europa Conference or something. Conference. Um, I think they they, they, they were in they were in the Europa League last year. I'm just gonna have a look they're back through their games. But year. I mean, uh, oh yeah, they're in the they're in the Conference League. Um, yeah, that's what I think. But. I mean, they spent a lot of money on on big players in the summer, like Schumacher and Paqueta and people like that. So they're expecting to be higher up than where they are. Yeah. I, I just think maybe it needs time to gel. Mm. But, yeah. Uh, I mean, Neil, Neil's probably reveling in it because it means it's more likely that Rice is going um, to be out the door at is. some point. He is going to be, no question. Whether he goes to Chelsea is another thing, but... <laughs> Yeah, I'd hate to see Bryce on another football club, uh, the, like a top what? club, but, you know, <laughs> hopefully the price comes down enough for us to take a look at him. What if uh, they fire Moyes and hire House and Hoodle, and he really, his style fits this team? Whatever his good luck style to him. Is. Yeah. yeah, good luck to him. I've got nothing against the guy. He did a good, he did a good job for us for a, for a while. Uh, so what is this game played in Saudi Arabia between <laughs> PSG? But what, what game was this? Because they had the an L- five a four. <laughs> they should like just cut the middleman out, and as part of the FIFA international calendar, have a Messi versus Ronaldo game at some point of the year, regardless of who they're playing for. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. stop and they, pretend uh, this has got to do anything with anything else. And they get to pick their friends to play with them. <laughs> they get to pick who's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah they oh. should have their... What do they call those? Well, guys? Ronaldo's team's going to be a little light in that case. <laughs> but, uh... we'll just call it... We'll just, just call it um, Adidas versus Nike. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. that's, that, that, that's what it is. And Messi can pick all players who play who have Adidas mm. contracts, and Ronaldo can pick all players who have Nike contracts, and yeah. there we go. But I mean, it was a weird game. I saw the goals from it, and um, it was very, very open, should we say? I mean, PSG won five four with ten players for most of the game because um, oh they had, they had a red card. Um, Messi scored a good goal. Ronaldo who picked up. A Please tell me it was Ramos. No, no, it wasn't Ramos. Um, <laughs> but Messi, Messi scored a good goal. Ronaldo scored a penalty and a rebound from close range. Um, but I mean, their goal was Hill. But he'll what take is because it gets them I, off to it? I understand what El Nasir is doing out there, but what is PSG doing out there? Earning money. That's what they're doing. Are they in the Don't middle? Have... Are they are they on the break or are they in the middle of this? Just a one-off game in the middle of the week. No, PSG has been playing games. So let me tell you something weird yeah. that I forgot to bring up. So, so after the World Cup, Neymar, not Neymar, Mbappe went right back to PSG, right? And mm-hmm. they played some games. And I think Neymar was there with him, right? Mm-hmm. And then, mm-hmm. uh, you know, then Messi was disappeared in Argentina, having fun, celebrating the World Cup win. And Neymar was with PSG playing games and then one day I open up my Instagram a few weeks later after the World Cup and I see Neymar in New York and he's hanging mm. out in the city him and Hakimi and everybody saw those photos and, uh, 
Hakimi. Mbappe. M- Mbappe and Hakimi. Sorry, glad. Thanks yeah. for the correcting that. So I see them, right? And then that weekend, while they're in New York, <laughs> the same day, PSG is playing games and Messi's back. And then they had an honor guard at training for Messi, but Mbappe and Hakimi is in New York. So it's like, did they like, uh, you come back, depending on who loses, you come back and help us out. And then we, you'll get your World Cup break when Messi comes back. <laughs> or did they not want them to be around each other when they're giving Messi an honor guard? Because yeah. PSG lost some important matches. Mm. Wow. Like either or was out. They're just so doing a job share. Weird. <laughs> it, it, it's like, that's not how you run a professional team. Yeah, they're the Harlem Globetrotters. So like, I, I, I like how right after the World Cup, there, was, mm-hmm. there were visuals of Mbappe coming back to team training. Like, literally the next day or like a couple of days later. Mm-hmm. And he was all like, you know, look at this guy. Like, he's so dedicated and he's so clued in. He, he's still hurting from that final loss and he just wants to get back on the pitch and get playing football again. Mm-hmm. Well, cut to like a week later, he's, you know, the team's playing. <laughs> he's watching NBA games. Yeah, so. he's in Times Square watching <laughs> acrobats. <laughs> and Hakimi. And I, that's like, even worse. He took Hakimi yeah. around too for the night. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. I think the fact that they went to Times Square is the worst thing about it all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I still in my head, like, if I saw them in Times Square, even though their face was covered, I would have recognized them. I probably wouldn't. <laughs> but that is crazy to have Mbappe and Hakimi mm-hmm. in Times Square with thousands of people and nobody recognized even though their face was covered and shit so it's just weird and then now psg's in the middle east it are they there's psg has a season to play like yeah so this is just i I, they're this is the sports washing diluting the french league Mm -hmm. you know this is not good like you're not supposed to be like you do this shit in the summertime. You know what I mean? <laughs> Not, you know, there's summer, that's what summer tours are for. You can't be touring. Summer touring in the middle of the season, especially after we had a World Cup. So that's just weird as hell. I don't know if anybody had anything else they wanted to talk about before we bounce up out of here. No, I'm just having a quick look at the PSG games as well, just to see where that fit within their... Yeah. Um, game schedule. So they play. They play. Oh well, they played uh, Ren on the fifteenth of January, which was Sunday. Mm-hmm. But then their next game isn't until Monday, and it's in the French Cup against like a amateur team. So this Monday so, coming up, it's Thursday now. Yeah. So they got a nice easy game on Monday that they can rest players for and probably still win at very easy, easy pace just all that unnecessary travel yeah. and like Ren is three and and okay so and this is a cup game yeah yeah this is a French cup game, game they lose that game those ultras because the PSG ultras um uh, they go hard I've, I've seen be, them <laughs> yeah I've, I've seen them this season <laughs> yeah they ain't gonna be happy yeah but I mean they then they, they lost to Ren as well in their last league game one nil yeah that's what mm. I thought yeah and they it's lost to like Lons not too long ago as well. well let me, let, let's see where they are in the French league. They should be leading it, but who knows? Yeah, because on the 1st of January, they lost to Lons, which was a really good game. Lons are second in the league. PSG mm. are top by three points right now. They should still win that. Yeah, they should still win that. They'll, they'll burn out that stadium if they don't win the, the, the French league. <laughs> those ultras. They stay, if that, fire, that stadium's on fire during the games with all those flares. Uh, I guess <laughs> the league you forget about this time of year, the Bundesliga is back, I think, this weekend. Yeah, they had their winter crazy? break. <laughs> yeah, they went from the World Cup to their long-ass winter break, which makes it even seem longer. And then you're like, oh, shit. Jude Bellingham and those guys have been off all this time. Like, everybody that was ever injured in the French League before the World Cup should be completely healthy now. 
like everybody should be fielding like a full on team. So mm. we'll just keep a, I'll keep my eye on that. Check yeah, out Leipzig, that Leipzig, Bayern Munich is the big one there this weekend. Yeah. Yeah, I'll probably check that out. Even though I feel like there's not, not nobody at Leipzig anymore that I'd like to see. Like, you know, I guess they got, <laughs> is Werner back there? Yeah, Werner's back yeah. there and Kunku's there. Um, They've got that um, really good Croatian defender, Gvardo, the one who's playing with the mask in the oh, World Cup. Yeah. Okay. Um, he's there as well. So they've they've got some decent players. Oh. There's um, there's a guy who's injured, but a bunch of clubs are looking at him. Lima, um, mm. Conrad Lima, who's a holding midfielder. So yeah, they've got um, there's some interesting players in that game for Leipzig. All right, All right Leipzig. Chelsea, I'll, Chelsea I'll probably buy on. a couple more of them. <laughs> yeah. The thing with Leipzig is, like, when Leipzig first gets on our radar, they had some players. And so you like, oh, this team is real. And then you start watching them. But then they sell those players. Yeah. And then it's like you lose that. You make some money, but you lose the eyes yeah. that, you know, that brought attention but, to the but team. They, but they keep getting these players, though, which is what I'm saying. Like, you know, one thing yeah. I even though it looks like Chelsea right now is throwing a whole bunch of money, the only Your thing that gives me hope is that the, <laughs> you look at the people who have come up with, right? Like guys from Brighton, um, Monaco, Leipzig, Man City. Like this is, all these teams have one thing in common. You know, they, they're known for their recruitment in the last five, 10 years. So I'm hoping like some of that, and we've been hopeless in our recruiting. I think we had, practically a non-existent uh, recruitment uh, uh, team ever since Michael Amanalo left in 2016-2017. So, yeah, I'm just hoping that, you know, some of this rubs off. Red Bull Blues. <laughs> yeah, somebody said, like, Red Bull gives you wingers. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's a great one. That's a great one. Let's just end on that. <laughs> Red Bull gives you wings. That's, that's, that's all you buy. Right? <laughs> Hang it, hilarious. Uh, I guess uh, anybody got anything to plug? I'm at Seattle. I forgot the name of the spot, but check my Instagram uh, link tree, and it's in there. <laughs> for I think February 11th in Seattle great show two shows one night February 11th and uh yeah and uh Austin was fun man all the shows yeah. pretty much sold out Creek and Cave had a mad fun there so thanks to everybody that came out and everybody at the Creek and the Cave and Rebecca Trent yeah you guys got anything no just one month from now I'll be that out there so you know yeah he's he's gonna come yeah. and do the podcast we're talking neil about him yeah. coming into the studio to do one so that should be fun if you want you should if you want to pull up or do it from there let me know i'll pull up probably uh yeah my my india trip got pushed back a couple of months so, oh yeah, you know, yeah so i'll be here so you're just gonna go to the wedding yeah yeah, yeah exactly right, that makes sense All right, go, cool. go for the fun yeah. go for the fun yeah. stuff yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was trying to be a little days. bit more, a little bit of an American stuff, saying, "Oh, it's going to be too hot in April." But I, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I got a little talking to about that. <laughs> yeah. They say you're going to make two trips, or you're going to make one. <laughs> but if you, the one is going to be in the heat. How Indian are you that you want to save money and do just one trip? <laughs> Or how less of an Indian are you that you're afraid of the heat? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you went full Indian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going in the heat. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks for, right. you know, good talk. And uh, thank you to everybody for listening. Uh, like and subscribe on YouTube and leave comments. We'll answer back. And, uh, you know, we'll see you and hear you out there. Take care of yourself. One. See ya. Shut this. Oh, no. Oh, no. Do this.